this is a target audience for me, and uh, so I uh, was really pleased to be able to uh, speak to you all at least about uh, these concepts. So uh, I've heard the word provocative used a number of times in talks, and I can tell you I will definitely put some provocative things out there uh, and, and make some generalizations or uh, statements about uh, some of my views here, but uh, uh, it's exciting. Uh, uh, it's an exciting concept uh, that I think brings hope, and uh, um, I certainly uh, have, have enjoyed being involved with it. So uh, for my disclosures, uh, uh, a good portion of this work has been funded by the NIH, uh, which I'm grateful for, uh, an R01 grant, uh, prior to that an R21 grant. Uh, several foundations have also uh, supported this work in uh, GAP uh, situations, and I've had uh, generous donors uh, who uh, have impressively uh, been uh, forthright in uh, helping to uh, support this work. So uh, my appreciation to all of these groups. I, I do have an ownership interest in some of the technologies shown, and, and they're basically uh, concepts. Uh, nothing is commercialized, um, uh, but I do have uh, that potential. So uh, I don't think it represents a uh, formal uh, conflict of interest that has that potential. So uh, Fontaine palliation, this is, the, this is the view according to Mark Rodefeld. Uh, it is, we all know, is the final common pathway for single ventricle repair. It's, it's palliative and not curative. Uh, circulatory in inefficiency is due to lack of a subpulmonary ventricle. And in all the different talks that I hear about lymphatic issues and ventricular dysfunction, uh, liver issues, uh, I click through my mind that uh, those problems can all be attributed to the lack of the subpulmonary ventricle. Seems, uh, it seems overly obvious or uh, silly uh, to say that, but anyway, that's, that's my perspective of it. We know it's a circulation that will ultimately culminate in failure. Uh, you all deal with that uh, on the front lines, uh, and there really are no primary preventive therapies. Uh, we may be able to uh, modify symptoms, ameliorate responses, uh, but there are no primary preventive therapies. Uh, Groupthink, so groupthink is a term uh, uh, used about, uh, you know, how masses of people come to see something, and we all see Fontan palliation as a life-saving procedure. Uh, same for me. I, I do the surgeries. Uh, I'm happy to do them. Uh, they uh, extend life. There's no question about it. The groupthink perspective is once you're palliated, you're done. And, and as I came through training and into my uh, surgical practice, that was the predominant view. And there really hasn't been much perspective on the long-term implications because there hasn't been any alternative. It's you're alive, you have a Fontan circulation, that's great. But uh, as, we're healing, as we're hearing, uh, it's, it's not necessarily great. And now we're dealing with uh, a disease that hasn't existed before in the history of mankind. So uh, these concerning uh, issues that you've heard about, uh, I don't need to go through. This is a uh, paper from Francis Fontaine, uh, written uh, in conjunction with John Kirkland, and uh, it has a catchy and memorable title. This uh, was published in 1990, and it's a prediction. It's not actual data. It's a statistical probability of what uh, Francis Fontaine knew was likely coming. Okay, so. At this point, uh, they didn't have long-term uh, follow-up patient data. The next slide I'm going to show you is actual data, and I just want you to see the similarities, okay? This is the Mayo Clinic recent publication, 40-year follow-up after the Fontan operation. And there is this persistent long-term attrition that's attributed to uh, various things, but it's, uh, it's Fontan attrition, whether you ascribe it to renal dysfunction or intestinal issues or uh, heart failure. And at 30 years, it's approximately or less than 50% survival. This uh, data also uh, uh, demonstrates uh, the magnitude of the problem. Fontan, I think I have a, yep, I have an arrow on the, Right, but not on the left. So uh, Fontan in adult congenital heart disease is the highest risk category for death. 
and uh, both uh, both images basically portray that in a different uh, in a different fashion. But uh, this audience uh, knows the severity of the problem. So here's a uh, provocative statement: the, the Fontan circulation is an iatrogenic imposition of chronic circulatory inefficiency that will progress to failure. Okay, it's a man-made form of chronic heart failure. We all know that on some intuitive level, but we don't come out and say that. We don't say that to our patients. Uh, we're shifting an acute problem to a chronic problem. The chronic problem is focused in the systemic circulation, systemic venous circulation somewhere. Okay, it's it. It's, you're, you're kicking the can down the road, in essence. This shows some of the uh, pathologies that you've heard about. Uh, sometimes this can be termed non-ventricular heart failure. It looks like heart failure. Uh, the uh, comments about how do we define Fontan failure, uh, it can't be clearly defined. It's difficult to define. And what I see in the literature, what impresses me is a lot of these terms or terms like this. Indolent uh, nature of disease, constitutional symptoms, latent disease process, relentless progression of disease, okay? There are sort of these uh, vague descriptions of a disease process that uh, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to pinpoint uh, exactly you know, what the pathophysiology is. In my view, it's absence of a subpulmonary ventricle. Uh, this is a patient of mine. I didn't do her Fontan, but she presented for a heart transplant. And uh, this was uh, several years ago. She, was, uh, she underwent her transplant, was successfully transplanted. She had Fontan failure. Uh, I don't remember exact morphology, but I remember being conflicted in taking out one good ventricle and putting in two good ventricles. And uh, she has the classic stigmata, Fontan failure, ascites, pubertal delay, uh, thin extremities. And uh, uh, when I explanted the heart, uh, I, uh, w uh, this is surgeon for you. Uh, cable occlusion, uh, uh, cross clamp the aorta, and it took about three heartbeats for all the collateral flow to come into the heart. When I transected her aorta, the pressure was so high, the blood about hit the ceiling, okay? Translated, in my view, as this is a good ventricle. It, it was filled, and it was a good functional ventricle. I was taking that ventricle out and throwing it in the trash bucket, okay? so. A little bit uh, conflicted. Obviously, uh, she wasn't uh, doing well and needed a transplant, and that was the right therapy. But given my perspective on this research, uh, it has actually been uh, interesting for me. Preload deprivation, we just heard a talk on uh, preload and issues there. I think this is really important. Uh, I don't understand preload very well. There, there are smarter people than I that. Uh, that understand it. I understand it as failure to relax, and I remember that because sometimes I have a problem with failure to relax as a surgeon. Uh, diastolic dysfunction is predominant in late Fontan patients. Not in stage uh, failing uh, uh, end of life disease, but in functional late Fontan patients, diastolic dysfunction predominates. This is data from a uh, Paige Anderson paper, uh, Pediatric Heart Network, published in JAK, I think, in 2008. Systolic function is preserved in 70% of patients. Systolic dysfunction, in my view, once you get to that point, it's an end-stage problem, and uh, it may be too late to intervene on ventricular function. I, I think diastolic dysfunction and, and uh, uh, things that we can do to improve that uh, may be uh, ripe area for research. So I uh, pose a hypothetical question. In Fontaine failure, is the single ventricle to blame? I think a lot of surgeons, clinicians feel like it's a ventricular problem. I don't think so, okay? I think the Fontaine circulation fails the single ventricle, okay? The ventricle wants more filling. It wants less afterload. It's, uh, it's a different perspective. Uh, uh, but that's sort of how I look at it. Uh, another sort of uh, hypothetical. So I have a right ventricle, and I think probably 98% of the people in the room here do. There may be a few people that don't. Uh, 
So I think to myself, well, why do I have a right ventricle? And if you believe in uh, uh, evolution or whatever you believe in, humans have right ventricles. That's normal anatomy and physiology. What are the essential things that a right ventricle does? If you, if you can live without one, why, why do we have one? It does two things. It maintains low systemic venous pressure. It maintains preload to the systemic ventricle. Okay, you can, you can really distill it down to those two things. So if uh, you don't have a subpulmonary ventricle, you're gonna have problems with these two issues. And that's exactly what happens in Fontan. That's, this is the basis of the Fontan paradox. High systemic venous pressure, low cardiac output, preload deprivation. So uh, in my view, and perhaps simplistically, uh, the therapy of choice would be to replace the missing subpulmonary power source. Transplant, uh, uh, it's a therapy for end-stage disease. There aren't enough donor hearts for all Fontan patients. Uh, it does trade one disease for another. Uh, these survival statistics may be a little bit older. Uh, I think there are some better survival statistics, but still, it's not a, it's not a lifetime solution. And when we get pushed into the corner, uh, yes, we transplant patients, uh, but is it, a, uh, is it a cure? It's not. Uh, VADS, I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about a device for a Fontan, so uh, it, what rings in people's minds is, is VADS, okay? This is my perspective on VADS. Okay, I, I uh, use them, uh, but use them judiciously, uh, and they're not perfect therapy. And uh, VADs that exist are principally made for adult heart failure and for systemic support. Okay, so I'm gonna go into this a little bit more and kind of tease out the details, but uh, existing uh, MCS devices are not, uh, well designed to be applied in the Fontan circulation, and I'll, I'll kind of drill down into this. So this is a uh, this is an article uh, showing right and left sided support. Uh, people have uh, basically done isolated left sided support, isolated right sided support. Uh, if you uh, look at the literature for uh, mechanical device support in Fontan, it's really limited to case reports. Uh, and there's an extreme variability in what devices are used, uh, and uh, people only will uh, publish their positive outcomes. And so the denominator, the bad outcomes, aren't in the literature. Okay, so this is really, uh, this is really uh, the final frontier for device support uh, in an extremely complex situation. So I just want to kind of take you through a little bit in thinking about uh, where VADs go and uh, how that's going to impact a Fontan circulation. So uh, this is a, a schematic of a Fontan circulation, if you will, okay? The majority of VADs are intended to go into the systemic circulation. So uh, what's that going to do? If you have a single ventricle that has systolic dysfunction and it's failing, uh, that device uh, will likely be helpful. That's sort of end-stage Fontan disease, okay? But if you look and see where this device is gonna pump blood, being simplistic, it's gonna pump blood into the right-sided circulation, which doesn't have a ventricle. And uh, it's possible that that device could actually worsen or exacerbate the right-sided congestion and actually make uh, physiology worse, okay? so. When you, when you really uh, tease it out, uh, you begin to see that a systemic device is not gonna be, uh, for a patient with right-sided Fontan failure, a systemic device uh, may actually, uh, I don't wanna say will be harmful, but it, it may not be as beneficial as you would think. Systemic devices are really uh, meant more for end-stage systolic failure. So this is, really, uh, this is really where we need the device. Okay, and if you, if you look at this, uh, this equates to a biventricular circulation. It's replacing the missing subpulmonary ventricle. This is data, uh, uh, just to sort of drive this point home a little bit more from Grush and Veltman, uh, looking at uh, systemic venous pressure in, in Fontan patients that exercise. And uh, you can see an impressive increase in systemic venous pressure with increased cardiac output. Uh, uh, 
A systemic VAD uh, in a Fontan patient may do the same thing. This has not been uh, done to my knowledge. It would be a great study for Grushin to do if he's here, giving him some, uh, some ideas. Uh, but systemic venous pressure may and likely will be increased, you know, using a, a systemic VAD. So it, uh, it doesn't achieve the uh, reduction in systemic venous pressure that we'd like to see. This is a uh, case report, a isolated uh, VAD uh, placement uh, to the right-sided circulation. And so uh, uh, it can be done. Uh, it's rarely done. It's uh, problematic. Okay, and, and why is it problematic? I'm just going to kind of go through this. So this is a uh, unidirectional pump, and the Fontan connection is a four-directional connection. So in order to get uh, systemic venous blood into the device and have it come out into the pulmonary arteries, you have to take down the Fontan. You, ha you have to take it down with a unidirectional pump. That's a lot of surgery in a sick patient coming in, you know, for an isolated uh, R VAD or right-sided VAD. So uh, it's a it's a daunting uh, task to pull that off surgically. The device and what's depicted here is a pulsatile device. It's intended for systemic support. It's designed to give a 50 or 100 millimeters of mercury pressure for systemic heart failure. Okay. So stop and think, what are the lungs going to do? Are you, are you going to push 50 millimeters of mercury of pressure into the lungs? What's going to happen? Not good. What's going to happen upstream to the pump? If the, if the pump's pushing out at 50 millimeters of mercury, what's coming in? Systemic venous pressure is, uh, let's say, in a Fontan is 18 or 20, okay? It, it won't take much for that pump to exceed uh, uh, and get into a negative pressure range. Okay, so the way the pump is designed uh, for high pressure flow is not a good fit in the right-sided portion of the circulation. If the pump fails, you put this into somebody, they survive, uh, and it fails, uh, their right-sided flow is 100% dependent on the device, and it'll be a lethal event. That's, uh, that's not a good long-term solution. Uh, what's the durability of this? Is, uh, is this a 10-year solution or is this a 20-year solution? Are you going to recommend this for your Fontan patient? That, is it going to last 30 years? It's not. Okay. Externalized drive lines, uh, devices eventually fail. The longest these types of devices are in humans is generally less than a, a year. Okay. So it's a bridge to somewhere. It's a bridge to transplant or a bridge to death. Uh, but it's not a long-term solution. Some of you uh, may be thinking, well, we have continuous flow devices and not pulse devices. The issues are exactly the same. So with the newer devices, the, the HeartMate 3 or the HeartMate 2 or the Heartware pump, uh, they're, they're great pumps and the technology is improving, but it's the same issues. It's unidirectional flow designed for systemic support and high pressure support. It, it, it's not going to work in the right side of a Fontan circulation. So uh, perhaps oversimplifying, uh, I would say existing devices are bad for Fontan, except for end-stage disease. The use of existing devices has clouded the optics for Fontan circulatory support. So the way, uh, the way we all see MCS devices in Fontan is through the lens of existing devices. And uh, I think that's clouded uh, the issue of how the support should be provided. Uh, anecdotally, systemic VADs are best in a Fontan that's failing due to systolic failure, not for Fontan failure with preserved ventricular function. That's, that's been shown anecdotally, uh, at least clinically. The application of a systemic VAD under circumstances of preserved systolic function is superfluous and may exacerbate Fontan problems. So this brings uh, me to uh, my concept and the concept of cable pulmonary assist. And uh, the idea of putting a uh, pump, the appropriate pump, back into the Fontan circulation to basically replicate the normal circulation, uh, 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 that idea existed 15 years ago. Uh, it's been a long journey of trying to figure out how to, how to do this safely and reliably. But this would be a holy grail. It would reverse the Fontan and allow you to manage your Fontan patients uh, under uh, 
uh, biventricular health. That's exciting, uh, very exciting to think about. Uh, I, I'm not the only person to at least have thought of this, you know, on a conceptual level. Uh, surgeons talk about uh, and have talked about these ideas. Mark de Laval is a uh, giant in the field. Um, uh, and if I, when I talk to other surgeons, it, uh, it's like, yeah, of course, it would be great, you know, if we could figure out a way to do that. But it's, it's a difficult challenge and not obvious. If you look at the uh, background uh, to uh, how uh, we got from the atriopulmonary fontan to the TCPC, the only reason it came about is because they were trying to figure out how to put a unidirectional pump into a fontan. Okay, and this was work done in London uh, with Mark de Laval. Uh, Philip Kilner is a radiologist and interested in flows, uh, general hemodynamics, and they were looking at valveless pump models. And uh, before computational fluid dynamics existed, they used aluminum dust uh, to show these flow paths or flow patterns. And you can see the laminar and turbulent flow. And it was uh, through that process of trying to put a power source into the fontan that they realized that an atrial pulmonary fontan was less uh, efficient than a total cable pulmonary connection. Okay? So uh, it doesn't come out in the uh, books that way, but this is the backstory to uh, how we've gotten to TCPC or what we think is the most optimal Fontan flow path. So uh, I'm going to kind of go into uh, more of the device and how, uh, you know, how can we do this? And it, it, uh, I'll distill 12 years of, of noodling, uh, you know, and trying to figure this out. Where do you cannulate? How do you assure the proper direction of flow? Should it be a pump in the vessels? Should it be outside the vessels? Any very complicated. Okay, this is, uh, this is what I think is the solution, uh, and it was unobvious. Uh, I'm not 100% sure it will be the solution, but I, I think it's a good solution. And, uh, and then the video on the right. So this video is filmed in my garage with uh, parts from the hardware store, uh, Target, uh, filmed with my iPhone and sent in as preliminary data for an NIH grant. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't tell them it was filmed in my garage. But anyway, it was an exciting day because, uh, as you could see, with uh, food, food coloring uh, for contrast, you can, see, you can see the basic elements of how this works. So it's a spinning disk in the center of this intersection. Okay. The other thing I want you to, to appreciate in the left picture is if the disk stops spinning, it's not going to block flow, okay? And that's really critical. Nobody's going to put a blood pump into the uh, middle of the circulation where if it fails, it's going to block flow, or at least uh, if there's an alternative, they're not going to, no one's going to want to put that in, okay? To me, uh, this is a uh, fail-safe constraint that is absolutely mandatory. In an otherwise healthy 20-year-old Fontan patient, uh, I don't want to put a device in them that when it stops, spinning, it's going to be a lethal problem, okay? So that, and this turns out to be a, actually a very challenging constraint. So uh, we uh, ran with this concept. Uh, we did uh, mock circuit uh, modeling. Uh, you know, there is no chronic animal model of Fontan, and so modeling these things is very challenging, okay? The, uh, if, you believe in, if you believe in mock circulations, they're, they're relatively accurate. They're not, they're not in vivo systems, but uh, in the left uh, panel is Fontan, and then on the right is Fontan with cable pulmonary assist. And if you can see it, uh, the, uh, in straight Fontan, the uh, vena cable pressure, VCP, is higher than PA pressure. It has to be, right? In a Fontan, systemic venous pressure has to be higher than PA pressure. And you lose a little bit of uh, pressure through the TCPC. So you lose uh, a millimeter of mercury, maybe, okay? When you apply a device, well, then you decrease vena cable pressure. So in this model, it went down to six. It went from about 10 to six and PA pressure went up by two millimeters of mercury, okay? So here's the, uh, here's the kicker, okay, is the delta P that this pump provided, and the, the pump actually was in this uh, intersection on the bottom left. You can see the, uh, the four-way cross, okay? Here's the kicker. Uh, 
the pump was providing six millimeters of mercury pressure rise. Okay. Do you know of any blood pumps that exist that are designed to give you six millimeters of mercury? It's crickets. There are none. Okay. For a Fontan patient, otherwise well, uh, uh, we need a pump that'll give you six or eight or five, whatever number you want is fine, but somewhere in that range, a very low pressure rise. And that's what the right ventricle does. Uh, in me, if my central venous pressure is five and my mean PA pressure is 12, I haven't measured it, but it probably is somewhere around there, the delta P is seven. So here you have a fundamental difference, and you're talking about a blood pump that's designed to give you seven millimeters of mercury pressure rise. It, it, it hasn't existed. Hydraulic performance, uh, the pump can be modified. It can give you, uh, it can give di uh, different uh, pressure elevations. So you can, you can add to the surface of it and uh, get it to pump at a higher pressure. And uh, I found in talking to people about this, they're worried about uh, pulmonary hypertension and high PVR in their Fontan patients. If, if your Fontan patient's alive, their PVR can't be that high, okay? And so, um, yes, it may be elevated, uh, but it's not going to take a very high pressure to, uh, to get transpulmonary blood flow because they already have transpulmonary blood flow, uh, maybe suboptimal, but it, it's not going to take a high pressure. So uh, the other thing this curve shows is an is a HQ curve. If you get into engineering, it's, a, it's a, not a typical uh, how much will the pump uh, pump type of curve. It's more how does the pump perform over different... Uh, flow rates, okay? And so the flatter these lines are, what that indicates is that the pump performance is consistent over a wide range of flow. So if this is in a Fontan, in your Fontan patient at uh, uh, three liters cardiac output, it's gonna give a delta P of 18, and at uh, five liters of output, it's gonna give it the same delta P. It's not, uh, it's not an obligate pump. It's going to provide a consistent pressure rise regardless of the cardiac output. Passive flow optimization, no obstruction risk uh, for a pump that goes into the middle of the circulation. It can't block flow. And, and what this shows is a TCPC, a, a, a computer model of a TCPC with no device on the left. The red is bad, so the red is kinetic energy loss. Blood comes in and it collides and then it finds its way out. People have talked about offsetting. 15% uh, offset will uh, reduce some of that collision. The, the, the most energy gain you're gonna get out of passive flow optimization, I think, is maybe a half a millimeter of mercury, okay? It's a, it's a the, the Y graph, for example. It's a, it's a good idea, it's a sound concept, but it's not gonna uh, be enough to make up the energy deficit uh, that exists from the lack of a subpulmonary ventricle. Y you need uh, something more than a half millimeter of mercury. Okay, the non-rotating device in the uh, right panel, it's not rotating, the red goes away, take the red out, streamlines flow. So uh, here's another uh, difficult to grasp concept is I'm gonna tell you that this device, at least in principle, uh, if it's in a Fontan patient and it stops functioning, it's gonna still be better than if nothing was in there at all. Passive flow optimization, okay? They'll divert back to Fontan or unsupported Fontan. When it spins, it's a pump. When it's stationary, it's a passive flow diverter. That's, that's the concept. So uh, when we first conceptualized the spinning disc, uh, I didn't know how to put a motor into it, and we uh, sort of ran with a percutaneous version of this with an external power source uh, that would go in and expand, and this is what the NIH grant was funded on. But I uh, kept searching for a way to figure out how to permanently power it, okay? And I knew that if there was a way to do this permanently, that could confer uh, decades of bioventricular health to a Fontan patient, potentially. The question was how to put a motor into it. And the, uh, the motor is unobvious, and it took a couple of years, uh, and I'll, I'll just jump right to it. 
If uh, most pumps have the motor components on the outside and the inner part has magnets and it spins, in order to get this inner part to spin with the motor outside, you'd have to pull it all the way out to the edges of the connection, and that uh, violates the fail-safe constraint of no obstruction, okay? These external pathways have to stay wide open. You can't get enough electrical energy across there uh, to run a motor with that big of a gap. So, so then the question was, well, okay, how, how can we do this? Okay, the solution, at least as, as I see it, is uh, unobvious, which is put the motor into the center of the device. So uh, this motor uh, is from Hobby Lobby. You guys have uh, Hobby Lobbies? Hobby Shop? They're used to run uh, remote control airplanes. This is an inside out motor. So most motors, the, uh, the center part is what spins and the outer part is stationary. Well, they make uh, types of motors where the outer part actually uh, spins and you'll see it here. It's a motor that uh, generates higher torque because the outer part has the magnets and it's got a bigger torque arm, okay? I'm not a motor expert. Uh, it took me a couple of years, you know, of scraping around to just define this. But the inside out motor uh, then became the solution to power this as a chronic device. So here you can see uh, the Hobby Lobby motor with basically uh, a pumping surface being put onto it, okay? The uh, shaft has the wires, so there's no exposed wires. The uh, electrical portion is completely sealed. The only moving part is the outer bulb or the spinning disc. Okay, so this is a uh, this is an early uh, proof of concept, you know, of, of how this could work. Here is a uh, motorized prototype, uh, not filmed in my garage, but uh, was filmed in. Uh, San Carlos, California by a prototyper. You can get an idea of the size of this by the uh, little alligator clips. If you've ever done electrical work, uh, motor, is in the, motor is in the center. So uh, here is the self-powered version, and I will let it speak for itself. So think of your Fontan patient and if their circulation would benefit from this systemic venous pressure reduction, increase in PA pressure, okay? The other thing is uh, people get concerned about pushing blood into the PAs. Or you're gonna, uh, the comment is you're gonna push blood into the PAs. This is a weak pump, it's very weak. It's uh, six or eight millimeters of mercury, and it's also uh, not an obligate pump. In other words, most pumps, uh, what goes into it has to come out. The, the pump veins go out to the edge of the, volute and what goes in has to come out. This one uh, is not that, is very slippery pump, so it's, it's not gonna uh, force or push uh, blood under pressure. It's going to uh, provide a constant delta P, and so whatever comes into it is gonna get a, get a uh, pressure rise. Uh, so uh, the concerns about pushing blood, uh, my, my retort to that is uh, that's just what my right ventricle does. My right ventricle pushes blood into my PAs. So I uh, went into a deep dive on uh, motor design. Uh, I collaborated with NASA, uh, an expensive process, time-consuming, uh, specialized motor. Uh, came out with a prototype that uh, functioned, but not to full feasibility. Uh, and at that point, uh, I had to make a decision. Uh, was about to run out of NIH funding. Can I get another prototype done uh, and raise the funds on my own? That's what I decided to do. Um, so uh, before I go into that current generation prototype, it, I think this is what I see as the future of Fontan. Uh, and if you look closely at this picture, there's two pumps, okay? The uh, native ventricle and the cable pulmonary assist device. Okay, which of the two is the stronger pump? Which is the dominant pump? The, the native ventricle, okay? That's, that's the intention. When you think about VADs, you think about a pump that's going to uh, overtake or supersede the function of a dysfunctional ventricle. Okay, this is not, uh, this is very different. 
This is a booster pump that is uh, low input, uh, cable pulmonary assist, modest augmentation of right-sided flow. Six millimeters of mercury, uh, very low pressure. The dominant pump uh, stays as the single ventricle. What does this single ventricle want? Uh, it wants improved preload and it wants reduced afterload. Okay, and, and that's what putting this right-sided device in should do. So, uh, talking about destination for Fontan patients, you can pick the door on the left. This is, uh, this is, this is the view that I have, VAD transplant. Okay, and you talk to Fontan patients, they know, uh, they know what's in their future and they are worried about it. Uh, they know. Or maybe this, cable pulmonary assist in biventricular health. Okay, so stop and think about that. Uh, we're not talking about uh, a VAD that's going to perpetuate Fontan disease and keep you alive, but perpetuate it. We're talking about a right-sided device that's going to confer biventricular health, biventricular Fontan, whatever you want to call it. So uh, I would ask you to think about that. So these are some images of the device. Uh, it's, uh, it's very expensive. Uh, it's taken years to find the right people to be involved with it. Uh, I'm hoping it'll be done by the end of the year, and uh, I can uh, show it to the world. Hopefully it'll work uh, through full feasibility range. Uh, a lot of engineering uh, that uh, I have some base knowledge of, but uh, really I'm not an expert in, so you, we rely on our uh, colleagues and collaborators to, uh, to help uh, figure these things out. Okay. It looks uh, a little bit industrial. Uh, obviously, a clinical device would be more highly refined with uh, mirror uh, surface finishes and that kind of thing. It's, uh, this is so uh, just a couple of kind of bring it back to clinical reality. So how will this change the way I manage my single ventricle patient? It would manage them on the basis of two ventricle physiology perhaps overstated and overly simplistic, but uh, if it gets us closer to that, I think it could be beneficial. What will happen if the device ever stops functioning? That patient will default to an unsupported Fontan. Uh, will they be well? No, they won't be well. Uh, they probably won't feel well. Uh, they may need to come to the hospital. They're going to retain salt and water because of the, uh, they have to adapt to a higher systemic venous pressure. Uh, but they're not going to be, uh, they're not going to die from device malfunction. What is the expected durability? And this is very different uh, also. So systemic devices, existing devices, bridge therapy, uh, total artificial heart, how long is it going to last? Maybe a year? Where, where, where is that going to get you? Okay, either a transplant or bad outcome. Cable pulmonary assist has the potential to add decades of life and biventricular health. So, in other words, improved physiology, improved health, potentially for decades. The longest a device has functioned in a human is probably somewhere around 10 years. I don't know the exact number because the devices have gotten better. But uh, uh, this thing, in theory, could function for 20 or 30 or 40 years and uh, push out uh, life expectancy. Uh, and not only uh, perpetuate the Fontan state, but uh, confer biventricular health at the same time. Super exciting to think about. Will this be compatible with a reasonable lifestyle for my single ventricle patient? The, the key to this is it has to be uh, user friendly and compatible with uh, a normal, healthy 30 year old Fontan patient. They'll want to swim, shower, exercise, sleep. They're not going to want to have a wire coming out their side. They're not going to want to have a cannula, two cannula coming out their side. That's not a long-term solution. So uh, transcutaneous uh, wireless power for this, uh, haven't gotten to that yet. Mark, we're going to have to have you sum up shortly. Yeah, thank you. One minute. How can I be sure this will work? It emulates normal physiology. <laughs>
So I, I don't think it's a, any longer a question of if, it's, it's a question of when. Uh, it may not be uh, this, it may be some different version, but I, I think uh, we've opened the door and I think that somebody will figure something out. So uh, all manifestations of Fontaine failure, uh, in my view, stem from the lack of a subpulmonary ventricle. Uh, existing MCS devices are problematic in Fontan and may actually worsen uh, right-sided uh, physiology. I, they will uh, keep a salvage role for end-stage disease. We need to better define the mechanisms of Fontan failure, and that's, that's beginning to happen. Uh, it, the, it's a question of is it a left-sided deficiency or a right-sided problem predominantly? Uh, and uh, probably key to that is going to be the uh, ventricular systolic function status. Caval pulmonary assist uh, will make the single ventricle heart disease amenable to biventricular repair, potentially taking it from palliation to cure. Technology is uh, in the pipeline, uh, and there's technology uh, besides mine uh, in, in the works, which could uh, make it possible for health maintenance or you know, preemptive, uh, preemptive strategies to uh, prevent Fontan disease. Uh, this is a good quote. It's been kind of making it around in the uh, uh, some talks, and uh, anyway, I think it's pretty good. I think I'm still uh, probably before the first uh, phase of it. Uh, the gentleman on the right is uh, Francis Fontan, and I've had the pleasure of sharing with him some of the thoughts that I've shared with you. And I can tell you that he uh, he knows that uh, what he started is a palliative. Uh, issue and uh, uh, believes that there will be some uh, solution to, uh, you know, improve single ventricle repair. Thank you very much.